I'd like at this time to bring up Brad Geddes, who's going to be our opening keynote uh, for today. So if you guys can all give a round of applause to Brad Geddes. Perfect. I think you walked through that, right? Yeah, I can use a forward back button. Okay. <laughs> all right. So good morning, everybody. It's, it's great to be here. I have been traveling conferences for years, and I've met... Bryant and AJ and Max and many people who are here in Salt Lake City and kind of wanted to come here. So I'm actually excited, my first time here, to actually enjoy sort of the Salt Lake City culture. So thanks for having me. And, and David was, was really astute and saying this is what he thinks it's about. In fact, I'm going to get into audience targeting this morning. And I started paid search about 18 years ago. And when he used the word audience targeting 18 years ago, it meant radio or TV. It had nothing to do with digital at all. And then about 15 years ago, audience targeting meant you were starting to play with display-based marketing, which we didn't call display back then. It was just buying banner ads, right? And then about eh, five, six years ago, audience targeting meant we're really getting into Facebook. Today, audience targeting also means search. So I'm going to really walk through how audience targeting has actually evolved and should be part of search strategies these days. If we have some slides, there we go. So, oh, I'm too far. There we go. So, what, what common thing that people are seeing these days are rising CPAs. I mean, this has been an issue for years. Hey, you look at your CPAs, you turn them over time, and your boss is like, our CPAs year over year are up 10, 20, 30 percent, so forth. How do we lower these? All right? And this is a theme of a lot of people is trying to get those CPAs back down again. Now, when you look back at the slide, I know you keep putting me back on the screen, there's a big drop and that CPA. That drop took 44 minutes to accomplish. So by the time we finish this, I'm actually walk through what those 44 minutes are. So when we think about what influences CPA, right? you've got average cost per click, conversion rate. Those are the two most common things people think of. Number of clicks per user is actually another important metric to consider. Right? So everyone's probably seen, hey, Google, your CPCs are going down. And Wall Street, all the time, talks about Google's lowering CPCs. And I go look at my data and I say, what lowering CPCs are you talking about? Right? And this has been a theme in Wall Street for five years now, four years now, which is all mostly YouTube and apps. It's not search, right? Search is most people are going up. So what this comes when we think about conversion rates, you've probably all seen this graphic. Right? Average conversion rates, 2 to 4%. Nielsen published that stat in about 2010. It's still true today, depending on how you determine what a conversion rate is. And I think this is one of the things we have to think about is, do we actually look at conversion rates correctly, especially when applied to audiences? So when we look at where consumers spend time with the media, right, TV's flat. TV actually is not going up or down. A lot of people say, oh, no one's watching TV anymore. Not true. Right? TV's pretty flat. Mobile's grown significantly. Now, a lot of that's actually double screening. Watching TV and using your phone at the same time, really common behavior. But what this increased media time has done is it's given us more touch points to measure. We say we love data, and we say it too many times, we get so much, we don't know what to do with it anymore. Right? And this is essentially what's happened is we've gotten actually more access to understanding all the touch points that have occurred and are happening over time. So, next slide, there we go. This is what the reality you should be thinking about set of conversion rates. The average person takes six visits to convert. Now, so let's think about conversion rates for a second. So let's say, I can't actually see this from these nice bright lights, so I'm gonna use easy round numbers. Let's say there's 100 people in here, it's well over that, but 100 is a nice, season, even number to work with. So let's say one of you, all 100 of you come to my site today, and one of you buys. All right, so I've got a 1% conversion rate. Now let's say tomorrow, the other 99 come back, and two people buy. Okay, and then the next day, another 97 come back, and three people buy. All right, so what's my conversion rate? Because I have 100 unique people 
and I have six conversions. But I have 300 visitors and six conversions. So my relative conversion rate is 2%. My absolute visitor or unique visitor conversion rate is 6%. And so that's the problem with looking at stats like average conversion rates 2 to 4%. It is that's on that last click visit which doesn't look at unique visitors, right, versus all. It's just all visitors. And so we have this ability to really understand, here's the touch points necessary for someone to convert today. So we took a bunch of sites, and this is stats for just one site, and said, well, all right, let's compare 2011 to 2016. And what we want to compare is, how many visits does it take someone to convert? So we looked at, in 2011, it was this site in particular, was 45% of people took one visit to convert. Now it's 38%. It's a 7% drop. So how many people take two visits to convert? Right, all of a sudden, that has dropped. The biggest gains are people who are actually visiting 6, 7, 8, 9, and even like 12, 14, 15 times right, to convert. So this means in reality, right, you've got people who come to your site initially. Most don't convert, but they do some behavior on your site. They can start to look at, what did you do? You downloaded a white paper, you bounced right off of our site, you added some of your shopping cart and left, you actually checked out, right? What did you do? Because when we think about these two plus visit people, some of them were like, you know what, let's part ways. You're on our site for three seconds, you cost us an ad click, we don't want you anymore anyway. Others, you're like, wow, you, you, you added some of your cart, you even added your credit card into our e-commerce system, and then what, your, your boss walked into your office and you suddenly closed the browser because you were buying something at work, right? Like, come back, right, and, and, and finish converting. And so we need to start thinking about how we bank these audiences on the search channel and treat them differently. So from a, a PPC practitioner standpoint, this really means we're kind of thinking things in sort of two buckets. Right? We have, okay, people we don't know anything about. We've never had a relationship, we've never got an email, they haven't been to our site brand new people, right? And, we, and our goal is to bring a lot of them in for, for fairly cheap CPCs. And then we've got, we can look at the behavior, we can say, okay, this bucket we really care about. This bucket, eh, we kind of care about. This bucket, go away, right? And you can essentially start to say, how do you treat them differently based on those behaviors? Now, of course, never use words like semi-qualified your sales staff. That'll start a riot in the company. Right? So we're saying, hey, you know what, I've got $10 to spend, and I can either spend $10 on the absolute perfect click to get one conversion, or I could spend $10 on 10 clicks, two of which are going to be quick conversions, two of which are going to be decent prospects, two of which are going to be maybe six-month prospects, and four which never convert. Right? So from an immediacy standpoint, you'd rather spend the $10 on the one absolute perfect person. From a lifetime standpoint, you'd rather spread it out and say, how do I treat them differently over time? And so we're going to talk about it as sort of audience targeting, how you treat these people differently. So there's a few different types of audience targeting. One is remarketing across display network. My guess is that 95% of you already do this. Right? The most common remarketing is across display. Someone came to your site, they added something in your shopping cart, they left, you make an ad with the products in it. Or they came to your site, they you know, started filling out a form, they left, and, and you show them marketing ad. Pretty common. But that's not commonly used across the search network. Search network is really, really powerful to combine with audiences. I'll show some stats in a second, how amazing this is. But remarketing is based on website behavior. So I want you to take a look at these stats for a second. So what this shows is various verticals out there. Now, these are verticals with more than 100 people using remarketing this for search ads. So remarketing for search compares the remarketing versus non-search data. So we say an automotive, our OSA is only make up 5% of impressions. So we're not talking big expansions here, 5% of impressions. That 5% of impressions is 15% of conversions. It's a really, really valuable 5%. Travel, the, the king, queen of 
needing many visits to convert a user. 6% of impressions, 20% of conversions. All right, so in many ways, this is why you want to treat these people very differently. Someone has not been to your site before versus knows your brand and what they're getting into coming back. Who are you, who are you really spending your money on? The 94% that are going to have your typical 2% conversion rate or that 5%, which has an amazing, amazing conversion rate when you bring them back. And so this is why audience targeting really needs to be part of how we think about search. Now, essentially, the longer the customer journey is, the more you need remarketing. So payday loans is gone, but if you look at payday loans, you know, you get two hours to get a person to convert, right? There was no, like, shopping cycle for payday loans. So it didn't matter. Remarketing, useless in that case. You're buying a $5,000 three-week cruise vacation package, probably not an impulse purchase, right? Probably a purchase you're going to look at and research and look at different places and take three, four, five weeks at least to buy. Look at several places. So the longer your customer journey is, the more remarketing is really, really important to get into. And another good stat for remarketing, a people who abandon a shopping cart. 75% of people intend to come back and finish the purchase. They just need that reminder. Right? That reminder could be search, could be display, could be either place. Right? They just need that last little nudge. Now we have customer match. Customer match is a very under-talked about feature. It's like remarketing with your CRM data. It's your email information you can create audiences from. So if you consider loyalty programs, Who's more likely to buy from you? A member of your loyalty program or a brand new visitor? Pretty obvious. If you're in travel, who would you rather spend money on? The business traveler who travels three times a month or someone who's taking their first vacation in you know, three years? Right? Very different of who's got that better lifetime value. Right? If you're a telco right, and you offer cable, internet, and phone, oh, well, someone who has cable, internet, but not phone, you could treat differently than someone who has cable, phone, and internet. Right, you can make, mix and match your buckets. So if you collect emails from users, customer match is probably a great way to do things. Now, one of the advantages of customer match is it doesn't need a user being on your website. Use offline data. So I could say, hey, everybody, right, there's 300 of you here. Give me your business cards. And our website's got good privacy policies, which means I can take your emails. I can make a list. I go to another show. I collect business cards. I can make a list. Now, that list would be people who attend in-person shows. Now, I can then take another list and say, uh, people who visit our webinars online, right? And I can make another list out of that. And then I can say, where's the crossover? Because they just really want information. They don't care the media. So now, we can take that information and say, all right, these individuals who like to come to conferences, we're going to market them differently than people who want to watch stuff online, differently than people who just want good access to content. We can segment out that same user who just wants to learn good content. Right, and that's the advantage of customer match, is it could be data from a lot of different sources, including offline CRM information. So we think about which one to use. Right, customer match is good for re-engagement or offline data, where remarketing is better for that recency effect. If someone's been on your site within three or four days, remarketing's great, even a month of time. Remarketing's great. But if you have, say, a year-over-year -year buy, well, remarketing doesn't last long enough. Cookies expire for six months. So if you've got maybe seasonal, maybe you sell Thanksgiving turkeys, right? And you have one amazing day every year. You know what? Well, remarketing is useless, right? I mean, they're not going to buy a turkey every week. But every year, right before Thanksgiving, you could use that exact same user base again, show them ads. Here is that seasonal buy time. So we also have DSAs. And this is not an audience. I'm going to combine with an audience later. So DSAs, or dynamic search ads, allow you to leverage organic crawl technology to automatically pick keywords off of your site and expand reach. It's kind of scary sound to a lot of people at Google sort of pick your keywords. When combined with audiences, it can be really, really useful. So we think about the, the targeting options for audiences. You've got RLSA, which is remarketing across search networks. The customer match, which is CRM data. They display remarketing, and you can use DSAs as sort of a feature of these. So when you think about what can you do with this, okay, fine, we have the audiences. 
what can I do with this audience data? Well, the most common thing you can do is just change your bids, right? Say, hey, you came to our site, you added stuff to your shopping cart, you didn't buy, we're willing to bid more to have you come back to us versus a competitor. Most common reason people start using remarketing. Now, when most people look at remarketing and they say, so you're suggesting a, a increase my bids again, right? You usually talk to Google and what's the answer? Raise bids, raise budget. Right? That's usually what, what almost every answer is, right? It's one of the two. Oh, like, and so like, I was like, the first time we looked at this, right, a few years ago, I'm like, so you're saying I should start with 100% higher bid. I should double my bid to start. Are you kidding me? And I'm like, this is, there's no way. Then you start looking at the data and say, wow, it's 6% of impressions, 20% of conversions. The data says in many cases I could actually triple my bid. That's a really scary place to start. There are, there are good ways of just starting with what we call reporting mode. All right, add the audience data to your account, no bid adjustments. So now you start getting information that shows you, hey, this audience actually converts worse. Well, you want to lower their bid. This audience converts better. You can raise your bid. So you don't have to jump right into these. You can actually just create audiences, add them, let it sit, collect data, then, then make decisions from there. Now, modifiers can be negative too. Right, so we're in Adobe country here, so we think of someone who's an Adobe subscriber. Right, well, Adobe's got a lot of products. And what they probably hate a whole lot is someone searching for Photoshop login, Omniture login, and clicking on an ad to log into their product. Right, that's a terrible click. That person's not going to convert. So you can make negative lists as well and say, okay, You've logged into our system in the past six months. If you search the word login, we're not going to show you an ad. You can just click on the organic link and go log in again, right? Stop clicking our ads to log in. But again, you, they have a lot of cross sell opportunities. So you might say, well, if they search for another product we offer that plugs into what they have, we actually should show them an ad as a nice cross sell bundled item. So you can go ahead and change up or down your know, bids for what you're doing. So if you just add this, you'll get reports. You'll just get stats and say, we're not changing our bids, not raising our bids, but we can see how this, how this works against our regular based ads. All right, so it's a good way to sort of just get some information first before you do anything. Now, another thing you can do with it is you can change the ads. You can say, well, if you're in this audience and you do this search, we actually want to show you a completely different ad to a user. All right, so if someone is a member of your loyalty program, your ad can put in there 10% discount for card members, for loyalty members. If you're trying to cross-sell, you can put in there, hey, you know, for TV subscribers, phone is 10% less. Right? So you could actually add custom ads based on the information you know about the user. Now, it's custom to an audience bucket, not the individual user. You can change the ads around. Common way is long sales funnels. Think of a long B2B sales funnel. So you got, someone comes to your site, first goal is to download a white paper, then you want to go ahead and have them do a product demo, then start a free trial, then become a customer. So essentially, you have an order you want people to do things in. So you can say, okay, for the group that has downloaded a white paper, but not started a demo, our ads, same keywords, right? Should say, hey, go try a free demo. Someone's in a demo, they haven't actually started a trial. All right, you can say, okay, you've done this, this is your next step. And you can walk users right, through a long sales funnel by using audience targeting, switching the ads around based on where they currently are in the sales funnel. You can expand keywords. So I live in DC. And forget LA, DC is the worst commuting traffic in the entire country. It's amazing, amazing. <laughs> LA, New York, nah, it's DC. In fact, to the point that DC has interstates that you must have two to three people in the car even to drive on it at certain times of the day. Like it's not just hub, you're not allowed on the road without two people. Unless you're in a Leaf, you are in certain years of Priuses, you're in a Tesla or some sort of electric car. The value of electric cars is huge because they let you actually break some of the hub rules in the area. Now, what this means, though, is that there are certain people who came to your site on a word like Chevy Volt, Toyota Prius, that they're going to buy something. 
And then you've got words like hybrid cars. Right? Hybrid cars kind of fallen out of vogue these days. So a lot of search volume. No ads in the entire DC area on that term. So you could say, well, if you came to our site on the term Chevy Volt, and you just search for hybrid car, new cars, anything, right? we know this about you, we should show you an ad to get you back in to actually schedule a dealership. Right? And so there's a great way of using audiences to say, we know you showed an interest in X. If you search for anything around X, we should show you an ad again. Right? We should get you back into that funnel. And so you could use different keywords. You can use different match types. If you have keywords that you bought in the past or too expensive, they might be useful only if someone's in an audience. So there's a lot of ways to use that. So if you want sort of that keyword expansion, you might have, here's our set of keywords we can afford, they're predictable, anyone can see these. And hey, here's some broad match words. I'm actually using some broad match. It has some uses, right? Plus an audience, because the audience member's pre-qualified. We know what they did. We know they did X on our site, and that we're willing to get them back if they search for something even ancillary to, to what we do. This is also great with dynamic search ads. So DSAs leverage organic crawl technology and basically say if the search query matches something on your site, then show an ad. Now, that, it has a lot of good uses. E-commerce, backfill information, a lot of good uses to it. But if you want a sort of initial foray into DSAs, a great way to do it is say, OK, you were on our site. Maybe you even bought from us before, your customers differently. So if you bought from us before, and you search for anything across our product suite, hey, let's use DSAs. Let's put these two together so that anyone who's bought before who searches for anything on our site can see an ad automatically. So sort of automatic keyword expansion only for specific groups. So with audience targeting, you can change bids, change ads. You can change your, expand your keywords. So when we think uh, about where this starts, it all starts with website segmentation or CRM data segmentation. All starts with segmenting information first. So the general rule, though, is when the list becomes so astronomical you don't know what to do with it, you shouldn't be segmenting that far. Right? So if you think of a simple e-commerce site, all right, you've got logo, you've got napkins, you have plates, you have logo, napkins, logo, plates. OK, fine, there's four lists. And then abandon shopping cart and checkout users, right? So there's six lists. And then if we go down a category, we went from four lists to 32 lists. That sounds scary. If we go to one more category, we go from 32 lists to 257. All right, no human wants to start with 257 lists. So let's just start with a few, right? You, it's fine to start sort of smaller, get the data, instead of starting with everything possible. Now, it's easy to talk about segmentation with non-e-commerce, or e-commerce rather. Non-e-commerce is the same thing. Everyone, every single site flows the same. Home page your category pages, your product pages, your checkout. Checkout could be a phone call, it could be a form fill, it could be an e-commerce traditional checkout. All the sites flow the same way. So even if you're a remodeling company, right? You got, hey, someone who wants our homepage, someone who said remodeling versus room addition, someone who said bathroom remodeling, there we go, that's what they want. All right, so everyone's got that same sort of flow regardless of e-commerce or not. Now there's sometimes some, some cool things you get into with this though. So this is uh, Uncommon Goods. You can see the same thing, Etsy and so forth. They have really good shopping, shop for types of categories. So when you look at a site like this, say, OK, well, what can that really give us? We know who uses shop for men category? Women. Who uses shop for women category? Men. So you actually can start making lists. It's not perfect, but it's say, sort of demographic insight. Now you know who, sell, who buys the most baby goods? Women. So you can make a list that says, hey, if you enter the shop for men category, you're probably female. I mean, not 100%, but you're probably female, which means if you then search one of our baby good items that we have, we should raise our bid because you're a female who converts better than male to begin with. So there are other types of segments you can do that start to give sort of insights into things beyond just an audience, but it could be demographic, it could be age-based, so forth. Now, I think of CRM. CRM is the most difficult one to get into, because every CRM system is different, 
All right? Do you really have one list? Can you segment your user data? What can you do in your CRM information? Right? I mean, so this really depends a lot on how you collect it and the technology used for your CRM data. But you've got you know, loyalty users, non-engaged users, people who bought a certain product, users who buy a lot but really low margin items, people who buy very little but they're really big items when they do buy. Someone who went to a trade show versus attended webinars versus demos. So really with CRM, there's no fast rules of how you segment. Ask yourself, why did you collect their email? You have a, a discount section on your sign up for discount. Well, that's very, very different than someone who bought your most expensive product. Right? Discount shoppers, expensive, very different types of people. So the more you can segment your CRM data, great but it's hard to give good rules for CRM segmentation because there's so many different types of technologies out there for it. So let, let's look at how this sort of works together then. So this is a simple ubiquitous flower example. So first holiday of the year, Valentine's Day as far as flowers go. So all right, you search for Valentine's Day flowers. Simple question, did you buy? Right, yes. Put them in a holiday buyer list. No, put them in a shopper list. Pretty simple, show me marketing ads. All right, second holiday, Mother's Day is about six weeks later. All right, so simple, you say, all right, are you in our shopper or buyer list? If yes, raise the bids, you're more likely to buy again since you're in the company. No, don't raise the bids. Same ad, right, this is an audience, just a little bit modifier. Did you buy? Put them on buyer list. No, put them on shopper list. Now, in theory, in flowers, the third holiday of the year is almost always an anniversary or a birthday non-predictable event time, right? It's not until you get into Thanksgiving, Easter, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, you see more. So you could say, okay, we don't really know when you're going to buy again. But we know if you bought once or twice, which now we know how, how likely you are to buy from us. So then you've got the next event. Could be Mother's Day next year. Could be the next anniversary birthday time, right? Where your, your list now becomes people who bought from you on holidays or your CRM data. Hey, if you bought from us last year, then let's show you an ad again this year and sort of repeat right, how people are going to engage with you. And then when you have that year-over-year -year seasonality, remarketing fails, right? Because your cookies expire, people switch phones, computers, whatnot. Right? Customer match is better. So it's really useful to start to think about how do people buy once, then twice, then three times, and then over time to, to sort of set that, up, that plan up you know, year over year over year. Now, in other places like SaaS, it's different. Right? SaaS is about churn versus sales. So you may treat new customers differently than you treat your over-year customers. Now here is a complex, much more complex example of what's possible. So this is a large SaaS company. It's not Adobe, different company. They have 10 plus cloud products. So big, big SaaS company. So you say, what are their lists? Well, they have one list that's for their blog. Right? These are like content amplification. In fact, they treat people who read the blog versus actually do shares differently. Because if you want to amplify content, they'll say, hey, this person actually shares our stuff on Twitter a lot. Let's treat them differently than someone who just read our blog. Now, you've got everyone who came to the site. Now, they try to segment that into SMB versus enterprise, common segmentation. Then they say, all right, did you download a white paper? Now, they actually have this 10 different times for all, all their products. Right? Are you SMB versus enterprise of a white paper download? And then you've got, can you put that back up? I can't remember all this top of my head. Then you've got people who started a free trial, right? Different group. People who are customers less than 60 days. People who are customers more than 60 days. Current employees. You break 20 or 30,000 employees, they can really mess up your ad spend. Right? Then we say TV commercialists. We actually look at when did a TV commercial air? And then based on the geographies of it airing, did you come to the site within zero minutes to 30 minutes of the TV commercial airing so the media for the remarketing can actually match the commercial? There's a lot more. When you think, okay, what do you use this for? Right, well, number one, employees are a negative list. They found their employees kept searching their help files and clicking on their ads. They saved a whole lot of money making employees negative lists. They're using your, your CRM data. Easy way of just not even remarketing. Just use your CRM data, upload your employee's email list, boom, done. Blog readers. Well, I say, okay, let's use remarketing this for search ads plus DSAs. That way we can kind of automate. 
the fact that our, our blog gets well read, well shared, without having to pick keywords for a blog. That's, that's really annoying. Then for site visits, it's all right, bid modifiers. Right, let's start raising this. And let's do a little bit for SMB, a whole lot for enterprise, because so we know there's a whole lot more SMBs than enterprise. Enterprise are the white whales in many cases. So, all right, did you download a white paper? Ah, you started getting into conversions. Now they want to treat you really differently. So let's expand the keywords for this group. Let's actually start using some broader keywords and different match types. And then let's actually change the focus of the ads to this group to have them start a free trial, because they actually started the conversion process. Say, so did you get a free trial? All right, excellent. So now the users, the, the, the ads more, are focused on getting them from a free trial to a paid subscriber. It's also focused on getting them to log in and try a trial. In SaaS, your biggest problem is someone starts a trial about 20 seconds later, maybe a minute later. They've either left forever or they're really into the product. Right? And so what is that second or third touch point to get them back in and, hey, you have a free trial. Actually log in and use this. And they actually use a different campaign. So that way they cannot use site links and call outs saying how here's all the other features you probably don't know about the product. Then if you're a customer, less than 60 days, right? you're still a new customer, good chance of losing a customer at that point in time. So now they want to showcase here, here's help files, here's demos, here's other ways of using the product. This is all the stuff you can do with it, right? How many hooks can they, can they get into you? And then customers over 60 days, now it's like, let's take words like login and make a negative list, but let's look at all the cross sales we can do and make those positive lists to sell back into our own product set. Now this is a lot, right? This is one of those things that if you want to get into this much, this is what's possible, it's a lot of data. Be prepared to either really manage this much or start slow, right? Find a start slow, move from that. This is how simple it can be, right? So this is the, the, the pro company I started with early on. Small e-commerce site. I've been working on this site for, I don't know, 14 years, 15 years. I know their, their account without even looking at these days, right? And finally, they're like, all right, I'll give in. I'll, we can do some audience targeting. You know the client type. Right there. It takes you forever to get them to do something pretty simple. So, all right, now this is a, a company, think of like a leads. So they do custom products, and custom products for businesses are different than for consumers. For businesses, they buy more often, and they, they have higher average order checkout values. For consumers, you know, some people really do want to buy 50 plates with their kid's picture on it for the birthday party. Right? But they don't buy this very often. This is a very unique type of a thing. So they have very low average order value. So they want to treat these users differently. So all right, so this is going into GA and making three audience lists. Right? That takes about five minutes to say, everybody, people who checked out more than $500, people who checked out less than $500. Let's follow five minutes of work in GA. Exporting and uploading CRM data. Took a little bit longer just because our CRM system, like many, is a little archaic and hard to work with. So that's one of those, like, how do we get B2B versus B2C buyers, which is shipping address information. Ah, it took about 10 minutes. All right, creating a display remarketing campaign. And that's hitting create campaign name. They're already a merchant, so they have merchant feed, add merchant feed. And that's a whole minute of work. Making a, a dynamic image ad. So now with the HTML5 response to design ads, you create a couple lines, you add an image, you gotta play with their branding a little bit, this and that, so that takes about 15 minutes. It's actually the hardest part, right? Playing with all the responsive images. Making a DSA campaign. Well, that takes two minutes to say, create new campaign type, put your DSAs, right? And then adding all this to ad groups. If you do this, do it in the editors, not the interface. It's so much faster in the editor to say, copy my lists, Select all my campaigns, paste my lists, paste them everywhere. If you don't do bid modifiers, you don't affect anything, you're just now getting stats. So this is, this is 44 minutes of work, which after 44 minutes, right, they had RLSA set up, they had customer match set up, they had expanded keyword set up, and they had display marketing set up. 44 minutes of work. This is what it led to. Right? RLSA is 12% increase in conversions, 9% revenue. 
customer match because they could reach B2B better, right? That's often a hard thing of trying to reach B2B versus B2C. They can reach B2B better with customer match. 11% increase in revenue. Display remarketing, 6%. This is month over month over month, right? And this is not super complicated, right? This is more saying, did you come to our site and not bounce off right away? Did you buy something from us? If you bought something from us, do we ship it to a business address or residential address? And that's three pretty simple questions, right? And then saying, how do we leverage this within our paid search accounts? All right, and they actually use RLSAs for, for Bing as well. Bing has RLSAs, by the way. Um, they don't have display remarketing, but they do have RLSAs. So you can do it in either one. All right, and so this is what a lot of it really comes down to, is ask yourself, how do you treat people who do certain behaviors on your site differently? All right, so someone came to your site, they now know your offer, for good or bad, right? You've made the handshake, you've made the introduction, they like you, they don't. All right, so they've, you've made the, made the initial connection. So some people, we're going to look at your ads and be like, never going back there again. Oh, well, all right, that's, we're going to lose some of them. We made the impression. Others, right, when they look at the ad, they know who you are now. So like, okay, I actually want to come back to their site again. But again, you've got to make sure that they see you, that you're visible when they're looking for something so they have that easy avenue right, to come back to your site once again. Then you say, what's the value of these different visitors? I mean, it's pretty obvious when you think about it. Someone who came to your site, spent one minute. Someone who added something to the cart, left. Someone who added something to their cart, added their credit card to your site, and left before they finished hitting the buy button. It's pretty obvious which one of those is more valuable than the other one. Right? That, 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 a lot of this is, is pretty intuitive. It doesn't require a whole lot of math to figure the initial parts of this out. Right? Ask some basic questions. Make some audience lists. I believe of the Fortune 500s, it's something like 90% have an RLSA list. I believe it's less than 1% have applied it to most of their ad groups. So it's one of those, a lot of people have started down this path, and very few people have gone far down the pathway. Right? And that's, that's, again, where there's a whole lot that's available when you start thinking about your group really in different audiences. So when you start, I mean, think about you know, audiences are no longer just social. They're no longer TV. Audiences are a word that should be part of search marketing now. Right? You've got RLSA, customer match, display remarketing. All three have different uses. All three are useful to use at the same time in an account. You can change your bids up or down. Right? You can exclude audiences. You can change your keywords, expand keywords, change your ads. But audiences, this is a small percentage of traffic. Right? This is not 80% of your traffic. Right? And when you're global impressions for paid search, I'm talking four to 10% of them, small percent of impressions. That four to 10% of impressions can make up 15 to 25% of your conversions. So they're the really valuable part of your impressions. Right? Lower CPAs, they know what they're getting into. And so when you think about search these days, average customer, six touch points to convert. That's average is six. Now, of course, some sites are one, some sites are 20. Right? Average is six. So the first one, Hey, it could be from social, it could be from a blog post, it could be from Twitter, it could be from a business card, it could be from Bing or AdWords, right? First one's there. You gotta get the first one. You need to say, okay, based on these first ones, how do we treat the rest of these differently? And then that's where the audience starts kicking in, is when you start treating people who do certain behaviors, downloading a white paper, spending more than 30 seconds on your site, calling your company, right? Treating them differently. And that's where I start talking really, really starts coming into play. And of course, I'm a marketer just like you are. And you know what the first rule of conversions is? Ask for a conversion. First rule. Right? The best ROI you can get, put a sign outside your business. All right? So real quick, we're an ad testing insight platform. You want easy, quick, simple ways of testing ads, getting engram data, see most people don't know what engram data is. Getting cool insights, take a look. We're a free trial too. All right, thank you.